I now want to introduce you to something called reaction mechanisms. You see, we organic chemists like to show how and why reactions occur by drawing cute little arrows. The arrows tell us how and where the electrons are actually moving during the course of the reaction. This process is called the reaction's reaction mechanism. When you draw a reaction's mechanism, please remember the following. One, arrows always point away from electrons which represent either lone pairs or negative charges, and toward electron deficient atoms. Don't ever, ever, ever draw mechanism arrows pointing toward electrons or I will cry. Let me show you the example. I've got an atom B that has electrons over here that's going to attack electron deficient atom A. I always draw the arrow going from the electrons into the other atom, not the other way around. I try to imagine, honestly, that this guy who has the electrons is kind of like an archer and he's firing an arrow over a wall and into the other guy. I would never point the arrow in the opposite direction. Thus, I've written, not this. And as strongly as I emphasize this, I still see students do it and it frustrates me to no end. Number two, the atoms that get attacked by the arrows are called electrophiles and the atoms that do the attacking are called nucleophiles. Now remember, the suffix file means something that likes. If I'm a thermophile, for example, I like heat. If I'm a popcornophile, then I like popcorn. If I'm an electrophile, then I'm something that likes electrons. In our previous example, we see that this atom A, which is electron deficient, wants electrons. It likes electrons. Therefore, it's an electrophile. Whereas the guy who does the attacking, this guy over here, he's like the archer. He's called the nucleophile. Step three. Double barbed arrows represent two electrons moving, while single barbed arrows represent one electron moving. So in this particular example, because I've got two barbs on the end of this arrow, it means there are two electrons moving. In an example over here, if I have a single electron moving, I just draw a single bond over here like a fish hook. For the time being, I don't want you to worry at all about single barbed arrows. We will not look at them for a while. We will in a later chapter, however, look at single barbed arrows moving. Classic example is this. Bond between A and B, where I've got a single barb going in each direction, represents each of these atoms taking one of these two electrons and walking away. These type of species atoms or compounds that have single electrons on them are called radicals. And yes, when we talk about free radicals involved in contributing to cancer, they are indeed oxygenated species that possess single unpaired electrons. I now want to show you your very first organic reaction, adding HX to an alkene. Now when I say HX, I'm talking about a substance in which H is a hydrogen and X is either a chlorine or a bromine. Here's the overall reaction. If you take an alkene that looks like this, where these R groups represent any hydrogen or just any hydrocarbon chain, and I react them with HX, where X is Cl or Br. So this would be hydrochloric or hydrobromic acid. What ends up happening is the double bond gets converted to a single bond, and I end up placing an X and a hydrogen on those positions. Here's the reaction's mechanism, which once again is a depiction of how the reaction proceeds showing the movement of electrons using arrows. Here's the alkene. What in the world happens? Well, these electrons, the pi electrons right here being shared between these carbons that are doubly bonded to each other, flip out like a door on a hinge. And you can imagine if the hinge were right here and this door flipped out, it forms a bond with this hydrogen. And as these electrons come in and grab this hydrogen, it breaks the bond here and thrusts these two electrons up onto the chlorine or bromine. What does that make? It makes this. Now the carbon to the left, because he just lost these two electrons that he formerly was sharing, now has a positive charge. That is called a carbocation. I've written that right here. Now because this particular molecule is positively charged carbon, which is called a carbocation, and once again that is pronounced a carbocation, not a carbocation. It's very unstable, this compound right here, and only exists transiently during this reaction. This type of molecule is called an intermediate. That will become important later on. Now you'll notice in this particular exchange that this X atom stole these two electrons and walked away, which means that he becomes an X minus. What does he do now? Well, he takes these two electrons and plugs them right into this hole and forms a bond with this carbocation, which gives us our final product.
which can be drawn more simply like this. I wanted to show you just one example of this in the literature. This is a big, crazy, hairy molecule. Don't pay attention to the hairiness or craziness of it. Just pay attention to the fact there's a carbon-carbon bond right here. As it turns out, these particular people, whose names are listed down here, published in this journal with this volume, year, and page numbers, a reaction which they took this molecule and they treated it with this molecule. Now I realize this molecule looks really, really hairy and crazy. I want you to pretend that all of this stuff, from the sulfur to the left, is just an H. So this is like HCl or HX, where X is a CL. It's exact same principle. This alkene reaches out and attacks the sulfur, kicks off a chloride, and then the chloride comes back in and plugs in the hole where the carbocation is, and they end up forming this particular molecule. Why in the world did they do that? Well, as it turns out, this molecule shown here to the right was converted over numerous steps more into this molecule, which is a molecular drug lead that they're investigating for treating supraventricular tachycardia, which is a type of heart arrhythmia. Now, I'm not asking you guys to memorize this example at all. I just want to show it to you to illustrate that the idea of taking HX or something similar like it, that and running a reaction with an alkene does have a real life application. Let's finish by teaching you about mechanism energy diagrams. To do this, I want to show you once again the overall reaction that I just showed you, and I'm going to assign letters to the reactant, the intermediate, and the product. Here we are. You'll notice that we begin with this alkene. We treat it with HX, where X is a chlorine or bromine. We get this intermediate. It's got a carbocation here. And then the chloride or bromide come in here and plug in this hole to form our final product. Compound A is our alkene, compound C is our intermediate, and compound E is our final product. You might be wondering, why in the world did I skip letters B and D? I'll show you that momentarily. Now, as I mentioned before, intermediate C only exists transiently because its carbocation is very unstable. This instability makes intermediate C higher in energy than A and E. So this type of diagram is called an energy diagram. You'll note that product E, in order for this reaction to move forward efficiently, has to be lower in energy, which is in other words a way of saying more stable, than reactants A. Reactants A are drawn here at some level, products E are drawn at some other level, and then I've got this huge hill that goes up here and then down into this valley. What is it, the valley? The valley is the carbocation intermediate. Now, you'll note that I skipped letters B and D in the previous slide. Why? Well, letters B and D are basically some unidentified, and at this point, unidentifiable state that exists between A and C, and then between C and E. These states, B and D, are called transition states. I want to point out one thing here. This thing right here, the difference in energy between A and B, the bottom of the hill and the top of the hill, is called the reaction's first activation energy, which is the energy required to get the reaction going. The larger the reaction energy is, the slower the reaction's rate will be. Which brings us to this question. How many transition states are present in the following reaction diagram? Now remember, this first thing right here is called the reactant, the final thing is called the product, the valley in the middle is called the intermediate, and the hills at the top are called transition states. What is the activation energy for the reaction of B to A in the following diagram? Now this is interesting because this particular question is asking how much energy is required to go backwards from B to A. You'll note that going from A to B, I have to go up this hill that in height is D. So D would be the activation energy required to go in the forward direction. But what about going in the reverse? And now to our last topic, degrees of unsaturation. I see standardized questions that ask about this topic all the time. To understand this, you have to remember that alkanes have the general formula Cn H to N plus 2, where N is any integer you want. Alkenes have the general formula of Cn H to N. 
Alkynes, which are compounds that have carbon-carbon triple bonds, have the general formula CnH2n minus 2. Do you see a pattern? <laughs> Well, as you can see, each time we add a double bond, it decreases the number of hydrogens by two. Now, the same thing is true if we add a ring as an acycloalkane. We can see that simply by looking at the, these examples. Here's an alkane. You'll note that its formula is CH4. In other words, its formula is CnH2n plus 2, where n here is 1. Here's an alkene. Its formula is C2H4, which totally matches up with this formula. Here's an alkyne. Its formula is C2H2, which totally matches up with this formula. And here's a cycloalkane. Its formula is C6H12. Which of these different examples does this cycloalkane's formula match up with? Right, with that of an alkene. Thus, we see that every time we add an extra bond or a ring, we decrease the total number of hydrogens by two. Now, each added double bond or ring is called a degree of unsaturation. Each degree of unsaturation once again decreases the number of hydrogens by two. Thus, we could say that the number of degrees of unsaturation equals the number of double bonds or rings, which is A minus B divided by two, where A is the number of hydrogen atoms your compound would have if it didn't have any double bonds or rings, and B is the number of hydrogen atoms your compound in question actually does have. A hydrocarbon that has all single bonds, no double or triple bonds, is said to be completely saturated. Let's take a look at this example. Give the degree of unsaturation for benzene, whose structure is shown below. Here's its formula, C6H6. How in the world do I answer this? <laughs> there are two ways of doing it. One way is to just ask, how many extra bonds and rings do I have? Well, I've got a double bond here another double bond here, another double bond here, and I've got a ring. So the degrees of unsaturation should be four. Can I use the formula to do it? Well, sure. The way I do that is by asking myself the question, what would the formula for a regular alkane with six carbons be? In other words, if this were C6H2N plus two, it would be C6H14. What is benzene's formula? Well, it's C6H6. So what is its degree of unsaturation? 14 minus 6 divided by 2, which equals 4, which is once again the total number of extra bonds and rings in this particular compound. That brings us to the end of our lecture and the end of chapter 3. It's been super fun, and I hope you've had a good time. I look forward to seeing you when we begin covering chapter 4. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.